All right, Brother Walker, if you went ahead and move on up here, he's going to uh, teach about, and I'm, I'm not going to give away what he's going to speak about tonight, but if you're the slightest bit observant, you might be able to figure it out. I won't be able to see the rest of the day, but um, it's always good to have the walkers in town, and this is get ready for VBS time, so they're always here for a couple of weeks getting things ready, and um, it's good to have them here and... Uh, what do you say? I don't know. What do you say? You're going to learn something tonight. I know that uh, for sure. I had this guy as an institute teacher and learned then. At least I, I think I did. I'm pretty sure I did. So open your ears and your heart tonight. God has something for you. All right. Well, we're glad to be here tonight. And uh, we're only a third of us here tonight. I guess it would be my daughter, daughters and wife are in Cincinnati with my sister-in-law visiting down there. And we are up here, and it's never been as quiet in the bus as it has in the last few days. So there's a blessing in everything. <clears throat> All right, take your Bible, you wouldn't. This will be the only Bible you're going to get tonight, Matthew chapter 7. And uh, it's a shame that that has to be that way, but what we are going to talk about tonight is a very needful thing. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus warned about false prophets in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 15. He said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. And a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, wherefore by their fruits... You shall know them. And of the, all the false prophets that have come into the world, I would say Muhammad is the worst. And let's have a word of prayer and then we'll look at some things here tonight. Father, we are grateful again to be in church and thankful, Lord, for the freedom that we have. Thankful, Father, for the word of God that you preserved for us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. Thank you for Jesus Christ who shed his blood on Calvary's cross to wash away our sins. Thank you for eternal life people we'll be talking about tonight have no hope. But Lord, we're grateful and we're thankful for the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you take this piece of dirt tonight that's standing behind this podium, that in me and my flesh dwelleth no good thing, and without you I can't do anything. And pray, Father, that you take this clay vessel, <clears throat> use it for your glory. Lord, we're not going to talk much about the Word of God tonight, but we do know this, that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And Father, we know that you have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And we know that when you said go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that uh, Arabs, Muslims were included in that. So Lord, you have a burden for these people and a desire to see them come to know you. Lord, help us get a similar burden. Well, thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Now tonight, what we're, what we're not going to do tonight is try to show you how to evangelize Muslims. That's not the goal of this thing. I can do that. Uh, I've got a, another presentation that, that covers a lot of that. In fact, I've got a couple tracts that uh, we've written. If you need a good tract to give to a Muslim, I, I couldn't find any, so I wrote my own. Uh, and we're going to get some copies made. Miss Leslie can make some copies of these. This one is called Questions for Muslims. And uh, they'll be available out there somewhere. And then I just finished this one today. It's called The Verdict is In. It has to do with the crucifixion. Muslims do not believe uh, that Jesus Christ was crucified. So I have here all, all the evidence that he was. 99.9% uh, .9 of historical evidence says that Jesus Christ was crucified. One verse in the Quran says he wasn't. And that one word, verse gets them to believe he wasn't. So this is a very good track here on uh, evidence that Jesus Christ was crucified. You can use those too. Uh, and evangelism. Uh, also, we do have uh, in the church here, these tracts right here, the Quran testimony. You need to carry these with you everywhere you go because inevitably you're going to run across somebody at Target or Walmart or Sears with the Habib or the uh, Hajib or the Burqa on and uh, you need to approach them with a the gospel tract. They need, listen, these, these folks, I, I know, you, you, you get this idea that if I get near them, if I say hi, they're going to blow up. Well, it, it doesn't work that way. They're not just, you know. Um, 
We can't, let's not be afraid of these people. We, they, need, they need to get saved, period. They can get saved. I've known the Muslims that have converted to Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you something. You want to see somebody on fire for God. You get one of these Muslims converted, they're just as nuts for Jesus as they are for Allah. I mean, they're not going to blow themselves up, but they are zealous, uh, unbelievable people when they get saved. One converted Muslim can do all kinds of damage to Islam for good. So you've got to carry these with you. These are, should be in the track rack. Uh, these are available. Make sure you have something. I, I, you really need to approach these people. And uh, let's try to win them to Jesus Christ. Amen. But what I want to do tonight is, uh, and I've done this in other churches around the country, is try to help you understand where they're coming from. Americans are incredibly naive as far and ignorant of what Islam believes and teaches and so on and so forth. And because of that, they, uh, it's very easy for them to lie to us. And I'll, I'll cover that as we go through it. But we need to educate ourselves and find out just exactly, you know, not everything they believe. We don't want to get into all that stuff. I mean, we could talk about, you know, the, the, the five pillars of Islam, the, the Shahada. You know, uh, I believe in Allah and Allah is the only God. Muhammad is his prophet. That's, that's the Shahada, I believe is how they say that. Uh, you could talk about the five daily prayers. You could talk about zakat. That's the charitable giving. You could talk about the fast of Ramadan. How many have ever heard of the fast of Ramadan? Isn't that incredible that they fast for 30 days, but not 30 nights? <laughs> See, this is, you know, all these Muslims, they fast for 30 days, only during the day. And it's a known fact that more food is consumed in the Middle East during that month than any other month of the year. We were at the University of Toledo one time, and I was sitting, uh, I had met a guy from Saudi Arabia. He invited me to come over for a dinner, you know, a Ramadan dinner. And I, I went over there, and I watched, you know, these Muslims stand at the back glass doors of the apartment, watching the sun set. And as soon as the sun went down, man, I'm telling you, the food came out. And it was good stuff. That's one of the benefits, you know, trying to deal with these people is if they feed you, it's going to be good food. And uh, it's just, you know, this idea that, oh, they fast for 30 days, only during the day. Not at night. But, you know, we don't, that's the kind of stuff we really don't need to get into. Let's, let's look at some of these other things here tonight. Help you better understand where they're coming from. And uh, so we won't be so easily deceived by the Muslim apologists in this country. Islam basically has three primary sources. You've got the Koran. They believe the Koran was inspired by Allah. They believe the Bible was inspired by Allah. It's interesting that Islam has more, ver- has, has, well, I think say, well, as many verses on the preservation of Scripture as we do. I mean, for the Bible. The Koran says the Bible was preserved. I look at these verses, I'm thinking, you know, the new evangelicals don't believe that. I mean, the Koran is right about the Bible, inspired and preserved. The Koran is one source. And then we have the Sirah. That's the life of the prophet, the biography of Muhammad. Ibn Isham is the fellow that wrote the primary book. There's, there's a couple of them, but that is the biography of Muhammad. And then you have the Hadith. These are the traditions. So the three, you put these three sources together, the Quran, this is, we call it the trilogy, the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith, the traditions. You put that all together and you get what's something that's called the Sunnah. And that's the whole picture. Quran, Hadith, Sirah. You put it all together and you have the idea and then the understanding of what uh, Islam believes and what they practice. You have the Tafsir, which is a commentary on the Koran, like we have commentaries on the Bible. But again, these are the three right here. Muslims believe in the Koran, the Sirah, the biography of Muhammad, and the Hadith, the traditions. All three of those go together to form what they believe. And it's interesting when you look at this thing that the, when you put those three together, the Koran makes up only 14% of that. You know, we as Bible believers think, well, you know, we have the Bible. It's our final authority on all matters of faith and practice. Therefore, the Koran must be their final authority on all matters of faith and practice. No, it isn't. Only 14% of their beliefs they get out of the Koran. 26% comes from the, the biography, the Sirah. 60% comes from the Hadith. Five principles... And these are not Islamic principles. These are our principles that we use in understanding what they believe. The trilogy, again, the Quran, the Hadith, the traditions, the Sirah, the biography of Muhammad. We call that the trilogy. Political Islam. 
I hope you understand this, that Islam is not just a religion. And it's not really a religion, it's a government that consists of religion and consists of law. And they would have no concept of the idea of separation of church and state. It can't be done in Islam. It's one thing. Kafirs, that's us. A kafir is an unbeliever. Anybody that's not a Muslim, there are numerous names for unbelievers, but kafir is the one that uh, uh, basically is, is the common word for us. It's translated in the Quran unbeliever, but that's a misnomer. When you put all the teachings together about unbelievers, understand this, that a kafir is someone that you can torture, crucify, steal from, defraud, you name it, you can do it to them. The kafir is the lowest form of life. And if any of you have ever dealt with Muslims or been around Muslims at the university or what have you, you know that they have a very superior attitude to us. And that's part of this thing. That's how they look at us. Low lives, basically. Dualism. Dualism is an interesting thing. And we'll talk more about this in a minute. But in the Quran, if there is a contradiction, two things. One, the later verse is the right one. It abrogates the verse before that. But here's the thing. If Allah says over here that something is round, and over here he says it's square, both are correct. So how can that be? Because Allah makes no mistakes. You say, but, well, yeah, we understand that. We're talking 7th century mentality here. We're talking nomad mentality. So if Allah says round over here, Allah's right. If the same thing is square, Allah's right. Allah cannot make any mistakes. And that's what we call dualism. Submission. Islam will not be satisfied until every nation in the world is in total submission to Islam or to Allah. And when they talk about total submission, they're talking about every aspect of your life. How many have heard of Sharia law? You've heard a lot about Sharia law? That applies to every aspect of your life, from what you eat to what you wear to what you think. Every aspect of it. And they're not satisfied until everyone, the entire world, is in submission to Allah. Now, here's this term. Arabic term, Nasak wa masuk. It means the abrogating and the abrogated. We talked a little bit about that just a minute ago when we talked about dualism. But in Islam, understand this, there are certain verses that abrogate or nullify other verses. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Sharia law, we just mentioned Sharia law. Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harb. That's how Islam divides the world into those two houses. Dar means house. The house of Islam, that's any nation that is in submission to Allah. And Dar al-Harb, which is the house of war. So you're either in submission to Allah or you are of the house of war. Which means Islam is at war with the world. They believe Allah owns the world. He should control every nation. He doesn't. Therefore, it's up to them to liberate the nations to bring them back under the submission of Allah. Takiyah. How many have ever heard of the word term takiyah? Takiyah is the right to lie if you have to. They can lie to you. And they're doing it all the time when you turn on MSNBC and CBN and CNN and or all of whatever those. I don't even watch them, but you'll get these Muslim leaders, these apologists will get on there and they'll lie through their teeth to try to convince you that they are a tolerant religion. The jihad is simply an inner struggle. And that's called taqiyya. I was presenting this in Bradenton, Florida. And after the service, a lady came up. She was a nurse. And uh, she said, I work for a doctor who's, <clears throat> excuse me, I work for a doctor who's a Hindu. And he said one of the first things he ever said to her was this, never believe a Muslim. Because they know they practice that. Kitman is simply not telling the whole truth. Just tell what you have to tell, don't tell the whole truth. Dimis, dimitu, that's the status of Christians and Jews living in Muslim countries. And we'll talk more about that. All right. And jihad, of course, we've all heard the term jihad. Let's talk a little bit about Muhammad. Muhammad 
Please get this. Muhammad is not worshipped. They don't look at him as a deity like we look at Jesus Christ. Muhammad is not worshipped. I say that because I've been in meetings before where these guys will get up and they'll say, you know, them old Abrahams, they worship that old Muhammad. No, they don't. You really sound dumb when you say that. They don't worship Muhammad. He's not a deity. He was just a man. Five times in the Quran it says he sinned. So he's, he's just a prophet. However, the Quran says he is an excellent model of conduct. It says he is an exalted standard of character. And uh, Surah 480 says he, he obeys the messenger. Muhammad obeys Allah. So their standard is Muhammad. The Jews have the uh, Ten Commandments. We have the writings, of course, of the Bible, the New Testament, telling us how to live, how to live holy and all that. That's our standard. In Islam, it's Muhammad. If Muhammad did it, it's okay. So Muhammad can marry a six-year-old by the name of Aisha, consummate that wedding when she's nine years old, and that's okay. Every Muslim should do that because Muhammad did that. Let me give you a brief timeline here. Muhammad's birth, April 20th, 570 A.D., First revelation in a cave, uh, 610 A.D. If you've ever read the account of that revelation he received in the cave, it sounds more like somebody devil-possessed than somebody getting a, a prophecy. This took place, the first part of Islam took place in Mecca. That's very important to understand. We're going to see that as we go through here. But uh, it began in Mecca. 90 of the 114 surahs, that's the chapters of the Quran, were written in Mecca. Say, so what's the big deal? In Mecca, Muhammad was a preacher. In Mecca, he was a reformer. In Mecca, he tried to win converts and over 10 years uh, gained approximately, excuse me, I think it was 13 years, gained approximately 150 followers. They couldn't stand him in Mecca. They persecuted him to the point where he had to flee from Mecca and he had to go to Medina, 200 miles north of Mecca. And that's called the Hijra. From that point on, the next ten years, you're going to see things change. Muhammad changes from a preacher to a warlord. And by the time he dies, he has 100,000 followers. He's the king of Arabia. He changes very much in his toleration. In Mecca, when he was persecuted, when he was in the minority, he was tolerant. He preached toleration. In Medina... When he became popular and became the warlord, he did away with toleration. We'll, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. He began to raid caravans coming from Syria. The Battle of Badr was the first battle that he fought in which Allah told him, I want you to conquer the world and, and do this. Second battle, Battle of Uhud, he lost that one because the devil tricked him. <laughs> I don't have time to get into all that, but it's, it's hilarious. The, the Battle of the Trench, we'll talk more about that also in a little bit. Terrible terrible thing took place to a Jewish tribe after that particular battle. He finally regains control in Mecca, makes that the, the headquarters. He dies uh, June 8th, 632, and 30, 24 of the surahs were written in Medina. Now again, 90 of the surahs written in Mecca, 24 written in Medina. The surahs written in Medina abrogate the ones written in Mecca. I'm going to show you that in just a little bit. But that's the difference. That's the thing you need to keep in mind. I'm, I'm not going to get ahead of myself. Anyway, uh, Uthman, when, when, one of the four rightly guided caliphs after Muhammad, was the first one to compile the Quran. They say around 650 A.D. Uh, the only manuscript evidence we have is 150 years later. And it's very, very minimal when compared with the 24,000 pieces of uh, evidence that we have for the Bible. You know, they have very, very little. So again, here's the growth of Islam. He begins preaching. He gains about 150 converts in 13 years, flees to Medina. And over the next 10 years, will gain 100,000 followers. So how can that be? As a warlord, I want you to think about this. You've got a bunch of young men, nomads. They're not farmers. They're not industrious. They're hanging around. So Muhammad says this, look, if you join with me, we're going to raid. Allah has told me we need to raid the caravans from Syria. You get to keep anything we take. If you get killed, there's a brothel in the sky you get to go to. Now, what young man that didn't have anything to do and didn't have any money would turn that one down? So he easily gains followers. 
through that particular method. There is a picture of the main mosque in Mecca. Quite impressive. And you notice that all the uh, all these uh, white things around here. And these see it very clear. All these right here. These are all people. Those are all people on their way to hell. And that's where it is in Saudi Arabia. Right there on the western coast. The Hijra. That's the flight. Talked a little bit about that earlier. That's the flight that Muhammad made from Mecca to Medina. July 16, 622. The significance of that is that's when they start their dating period. If you look at anything that has Islamic dates, it always give you the number and then say A-H. What they're talking about is it's so many years after the Hijra. They begin their calendar with with Muhammad's fleeing from Medina, from Mecca to Medina. That's how significant that was, and that's uh, when things took the big change. In Yathrib or Medina is where Muhammad became the warlord. And again, Mecca is right there in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Medina, two hundred miles to the north, and he fled on that particular night. There is the mosque in Medina, another very impressive structure, and again surrounded by multitudes of souls that are on their way to hell. Now this term, the abrogating and the abrogated. If a verse later comes that disagrees or contradicts a verse before that, the later verse uh, is what, what, what is used, the other one is done away with. Uh, for example, in uh, Surah chapter 2, verses, uh, uh, verse 106, it says this, when we cancel a message or throw it into oblivion, we replace it with one better or one similar. Do you not know that God has power over all things? So again, if, we, if this verse was wrong, we're going to throw that one out and we're going to replace it with this one over here. Because Allah can do anything, I guess including lie. Surah 13.39, God abrogates or confirms whatsoever he will, for he has with him the book of books. Which is a very interesting thought. If, if Allah has, and that's what they believe, that Allah has the Quran eternal in the heavens and gave it to, recited it to Muhammad. Quran means recitation. Well, gives it to Muhammad then why do you have to change anything? Somebody's messing up somewhere. <laughs> but anyway, it doesn't matter. Allah can do anything. Uh, Surah 16101, when we replace a message with another, and God knows best what he reveals, that's, that's their cop-out. So let me give an example of it. In Mecca, remember in Mecca, he was the preacher, the reformer, the minority. Uh, here's what he said. To you be your religion, and to me my religion. Well, that sounds pretty tolerant, doesn't it? Anybody hear that one on MSNBC or CNN? I've heard that one. You'll have a Muslim, they're interviewing some Muslim at a rally, and he'll say, well, to you be your religion and to me my religion. That's what the Quran says. And he's right. That's what it says. Early in Medina, when Muhammad had just arrived there, when he hadn't established himself yet as the warlord, he said this, there is no compulsion in religion. So you'll hear them get on the news and say the same thing. What's this? Why are you so worried about jihad? There is no compulsion in religion. We're not practicing jihad. We don't want to take over America. However, as things changed in Medina and became the warlord and the king of Arabia, this is what he said. Then when the sacred months have passed, then kill the Mushrikin. That's the unbelievers, the Kafirs. Wherever you find them, capture them and besiege them, and I can give you verse after verse. These are known as the verses of the sword. Here's what uh, the Siuti said, a famous Islamic scholar. He said, everything in the Quran about forgiveness is abrogated. By Surah 9.5. So there he says very clearly. If you read some verses in the Quran about forgiveness, understand this. It was abrogated, nullified by the verse of the sword, Surah 9.5. Al-Shakani, another uh, well-known Islamic scholar, said Islam is unanimous about fighting the unbelievers and forcing them to Islam or submitting and paying the jizya. I'll talk more about that. And being killed. The verse of verses about forgiving them are abrogated unanimously by the obligation of fighting in any case. So what the truth is, when Muhammad got in power in Medina, he said, let's forget all this stuff about forgiveness and forget all this stuff about tolerance. We're going to kill you. So the Quran has a natural division. And understand this, when you pick up a Quran, the first chapter is the introduction, the first surah is the introduction. The following surahs are in not in chronological order. They're in the order of length, the longest to the shortest. So if you try to read a Quran, you're saying this stuff is a bunch of mumble jumbled mess. What is this? 
Well, it's not in chronological order. It's just the longest to the shortest. But if you've got a good translation of the Quran, I think Yusuf Ali in his translation does this, and there are others that do it. Each surah, each chapter will say either Medina or Mecca. And understand this, the surahs of Medina abrogate the ones from Mecca. In Mecca, you had verses of tolerance. The Medinan verses, you have the verses of the sword. What these Muslim apologists will do, practicing taqiyya, will only quote to you naive Americans the verses that are Meccan. And they stay away from the verses that are Medinan. And if you, if you don't understand that, you get confused. If you understand that, then you realize what's going on. And their, their hope is most Americans will never understand that. So if you put the trilogy together, remember the trilogy, the Quran, the Hadith, and the biographies. You put them together, 31% of them are devoted to jihad. 21% of the, the Hadith, 67% of the Sirah, 24% of the Medinan Quran devoted to jihad. The Meccan Quran, because he was the minority then. They were trying to kill him. So he couldn't run around talking about killing you. He had to play it smart, just like they do in America now. They play it smart because they're still in the minority. Anti-Jew texts in the trilogy. The Meccan Quran, only 1%. Anti-Jew. The Medinan Quran, 17%. Sirah, 12%. Hadith, 8.9%. Anti-Jew. So if you average it out, 9.3% of the trilogy is anti-Jew. You say, preacher, that's not that bad. Well, if you compare it with this one. Mein Kampf, 7%. So they're a little worse than that book. And we know the problem that one caused. So Islam is a religion of peace. Yeah, it's a religion of peace. I mean, uh, when you kill all your enemies, you don't have any problem, do you? Now, I mentioned this battle of the trench. It's here at this battle, Muhammad had the vision of conquering Arabia and beyond. It's here that he coined the phrase, war is deceit. Now, that's very important to understand that because Islam is at war with the world. And war is deceit, therefore you're allowed to deceive the world. And this is an incredible battle that was fought here. Not I should, an incredible victory without a battle. Uh, if you'll notice, the, um, this is the layout of this particular battle. And someone told him, you know, if you dig a trench right there, if you dig a trench right there, that'll be your best defense. They had lava rock flows around here that they could hide behind. And uh, this is in Medina. And notice you've got the Quraysh encampment. They're, they're going to battle Muhammad. And the Banu Gadafan tribe right here that were working together with these guys to attack Muhammad. And what happened was... They couldn't cross the trenches. They had a hard time trying to get across these trenches. It took about two or, two, two or three weeks of, of trying to do this, along with the fact that Mohammed sent one of his guys in to do a little espionage. And his guy went to the one tribe and said, you know, this, these, this, these people over here, they're not going to fight with you when the battle starts. And then he goes to that tribe over there and says, you know, these people over here aren't going to fight with you. So you got the two uh, tribes that are attacking that are going have doubts about each other. They can't get across the trench, and they decide after a while, forget it, we'll leave. So there's no real victory there, but Muhammad won the siege. Now, in the meanwhile, you've got the Banu Quraysh tribe, Banu Quraysh tribe right here, Jewish tribe, trying to remain neutral in this whole thing. They didn't side with Muhammad, and they didn't side against him. Well, because they remained neutral, this is what uh, Allah thought about those Jews. He called them, you brothers of monkeys. As God has disgraced you and brought his vengeance upon you, the Koran refers to Jews as monkeys and pigs, or apes and pigs. So, 600 to 700 Jewish men were massacred. They filled those trenches up with the bodies of the men of that particular tribe. The women were taken and the children were taken into slavery. It's said that uh, the grinding stones had to be spinning all the time to keep the sword sharp enough to chop the heads off. But understand this, Muhammad's the excellent role model of conduct. He that obeys Muhammad obeys Allah. So if Muhammad did stuff like that, it's okay. Here's a clip 
of, uh, it's in Arabic, but the words are underneath it, so you're going to have to read along with it. But uh, it's the brainwashing of a three and a half year old girl. Listen closely. النهارده ريبورتاجنا شويه مختلف لانه ضيفتنا هتكون طفله طفله مسلمه بس فعلا مسلمه المفروض ان شاء الله ربنا يقدرنا وكلنا نربي ولادنا نفس التربيه دي بحيث تطلع يطلع كل الجيل الجاي اولادنا كلهم مسلمين صح فاهمين يعني انهم مسلمين كان ايفون هير اوكي ادائهم مسلمين الطفله دي هتعرفك دلوقتي على نفسها هي بنت اخت ليا في الله وايده وبنت الفنان وجدي العربي وهي اسمها بسمله وهنسالها كمان السلام عليكم اسمك ايه؟ بسمله بسمله عندك كام سنه؟ ثلاث سنين انت مسلمه؟ اه بسمله انت تعرفي اليهود؟ اه بتحبيهم؟ لا ما بتحبيهمش ليه؟ كيف؟ عشان هم ايه؟ هم قرد وخنادير عشان هم قرد وخنادير؟ مين قال عليهم كده؟ ربنا قال عليهم في القرآن قال عليهم في القرآن كده صح طب ويا بسمله اليهود بيعملوا ايه؟ ايه؟ بيعملوا ايه؟ شركة بيت <تصفيق> الله انت تعرفي المقاطعة كمان يا بسمله؟ اه وهم كانوا بيحبوا سيدنا محمد الرسول عليه الصلاة والسلام؟ لا لا كان ليه كانوا بيعملوا فيه ايه اليهود؟ عشان هو قوي ويقدر يقتل حد كمان طبعا سيدنا محمد عليه الصلاه كان قوي كان يقدر يقتلهم طيب و انت تعرفي احاديث عن اليهود مع سيدنا محمد عملوا فيه ايه؟ مم. ايه؟ ايه؟ في قصه انت عارفاها؟ اه ايه؟ بعد الست اليهوديه الست اليهوديه عملت ايه سيدنا محمد عليه الصلاه والسلام؟ كانوا الست اليهوديه ايه؟ ذوات غروب وذوات علمت النبي عليه الصلاه والسلام واصحابه وايه لما يابس نانسي عبتاتي بجيم اه قالت له اه فقال لها ليه عملت كده؟ قالت له لا لا لو انت لذاك هتموت ولا غير زحمتك؟ لا طب لا لو انت صادق الله يحميك وربنا حمى الرسول عليه الصلاه والسلام طبعا واصحابه مات فهو راح موت الست دي طبعا كانت حاطط لهم سم في الاكل اليهوديه دي اه بسم الله ما شاء الله على بسم الله بسم الله ما شاء الله عليها ربنا يكرمها ويعني الواحد فعلا ما يتمناش من من ربنا ابدا بنت اكتر او من كده مؤمنه قد ايه ما شاء الله ربنا يكرمها وربنا يكرم والدها ووالدتها واحنا المفروض هو ده الاطفال الجيل الجاي ان شاء الله لازم هم يبقوا المسلمين الصح كده نربيهم من وهم اطفال كده ان هم يبقوا مسلمين صح So there's their children's outreach ministry. And that stuff goes on in uh, Islamic schools all around the world, probably in the United States. And that little girl could be your granddaughter, could be my granddaughter. That's how wicked this religion is. Now, I mentioned earlier Dimmies. Uh, Bat Yor is an Egyptian woman that fled to flee Egypt in the 1950s because of the uh, nation of Israel existing. And uh, she lived under the... Uh, what it was like to be a uh, second-class citizen. Yusuf Ali in uh, Surah 929 said this, Fight those who believe not in God, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden, which hath been for forbidden by God and his apostle, nor acknowledge the religion of truth. That's us. We don't acknowledge Islam. Even if they are the people of the book, people of the books of the Jews and the Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Three choices a person has when Islam takes over a country. Uh, I should say the Jews and Christians. Three choices. Number one, fight and die. Number two, convert. Number three, keep your religion, but you have to pay the tax. That's the jizya. You know, the mafia did that in New York and Detroit and Miami and Chicago. A protection fee. If you give us a certain amount of money, we'll protect you. It's extortion. But that's what a non-Muslim has to do if they're a Christian and a Jew living in an Islamic nation. And the purpose is to bring them in submission. What they want to do is this. They want to make life so miserable for the dimmies that they will not want to live. They won't want to have children. 
and their existence simply dies out. That's the goal. And it's a terrible, terrible way to live. And this lady lived through that. She wrote a book called Eurabia, understands what's going on in Europe today. Uh, that's her right there. An Egyptian, uh, again, 1957, had to flee. She said this, The ideology of jihad was formulated by Muslim theologians from the 8th century onward. It separates humanity into two hostile blocks, the community of Muslims, that's Dar al-Harb, excuse me, Dar al-Islam, and the infidels, Dar al-Harb. Allah commands the Muslims to conquer the whole world. So they're commanded to conquer the whole world. Is the United States in the world? They're commanded to conquer the United States in order to apply Quranic laws. Its principle is based upon the inequality between the community of Allah and the infidels. That's why they don't like the Constitution. They don't believe in, in the equality. They don't believe you know, all men are created equal. They believe all men are created unequal. Muslims are superior. Everybody else is inferior. That's their approach. Now, the first is a superior group whose mission it is to rule the world. The second must submit to it. That's what we're dealing with. If you're a demi, you can't build a new church, temple, or synagogue. No prayer or reading out loud because a Muslim might hear that. No published materials to the public, so no track passing. No crosses on houses or churches because they don't believe in the crucifixion. No public display of religious ceremonies or festivals. Not allowed an army unless absolutely needed, but can never be leaders. So that's dimitude. That's the demi status. If you don't go along with that, you can be like uh, Raf, uh, Rafid Rod, six years old, and her sister, uh, Ranid, 16, who were shot at point blank range in Syria because they didn't want to submit like they were supposed to. And, of course, we know in 1922, the Turkish army is invading uh, the city of Smyrna. And uh, having a massacre there, you say, well, those were Greek Orthodox. It doesn't matter to them. If you, if you name the name of Christ, you can be a Baptist, Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Jehovah Witness. If you name the name of Christ, you're the enemy. Uh, Bridget, uh, Bridget uh, Gabriel, how many have heard of Bridget Gabriel? Wrote the book, uh, Because They Hate. Uh, brought out the fact in her book that the phrase in the Middle East is this. Today's Saturday, tomorrow's Sunday. And what that means is we're going to kill the Jews first. They worship on Saturday. Then we're going to go after the Christians. I mean, that's what they believe. Here's an artist's rendition of what went on in Ar Ar Armenia, 1894, 1895, as Muslims raided there. You could, you could just go on and on. I mean, this is, this is the way these people are. Uh, one of the best arguments against Muslim toleration is to simply look around the world. Uh, look at the history. Look what they did when they went into, went into Constantinople and the terrible things they did there. Look what they did when they went into Spain. It's just history is filled with this kind of stuff. So if you want to know what they're really like, that's how they are right there. Somebody, uh, there's a website called religionofpeace.com. Somebody, Islam changing the world or something like that. And what the guy does on this website is lists Every terror act that takes place in the world every day. There are eight, nine, ten a day. And they're by Muslims. He's got it listed day after day after day. You say, why doesn't our news media cover it? They wouldn't have time to cover it all. But this guy, you don't believe that? Look at it. Religionofpeace.org.com. And it has that information there. So Muhammad's death, the apostle died, Aisha said, this is his six-year-old bride. The apostle, she's 17 at this time. The apostle died in my bosom during the, my turn, the night Muhammad was to spend sleeping with her. I was wrong, had wronged none in regard to him. I was, it was due to my ignorance and extreme youth that the apostle died in my arms. But she does give this account that when Muhammad died, he said this, Allah's damnation be on the Jews and the Christians who made the graves of their prophets objects of worship. We usually give great credibility to the last words of a dying individual. His last words, Allah's damnation be on Jews and Christians. And yet when Jesus Christ died, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When Stephen was stoned, he said, lay not the sin to their charge. Muhammad dies, he says, God, curse the Jews and the Christians. And after Muhammad, you have the period that's known as the four rightly guided caliphs, Abu Bakr, not a good one. Umar, probably the best one. Uthman was the guy that tried to uh, bring a revision of the Koran and to put it all together. He died in absolute shame. And Ali, he was the last one. 
And we know that in Islam there are two parties. There's the Sunnis and the Shias. The way that came about was that the Shias, they believe they can trace their genealogy back to Muhammad. And the Sunnis don't. There was a split. There was a change of allegiance by some. Some sided with, with Ali. Some sided with, uh, with the others. So you have the, the two parties. And they hate each other. The Sunnis just simply believe in the strict adherence to the Sunnah. You know, that's the combination of the trilogy. Um, they know they can't trace themselves back to Muhammad. Shia Muslims make up about 15% of the worldwide Muslim community, of which Iran is. Iran is Shia. Ahmadinejad is Shia. But that's only 15% of the Muslim community. Now, as far as what's going on in the United States, they have been trying to infiltrate this country since the 70s. I have an interview with uh, an FBI, FBI agent who was part of the uh, Holy Land Foundation bust. How many remember the Holy Land Foundation bust? It was the largest bust of its time where they raided the home of the Holy Land Foundation and found all their literature. I believe 108 or 180 people were convicted because of this. We don't hear much about it, but uh, I want you to listen to this. Uh, John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Guy. Appreciate you all having welcome, me. Welcome, John. I've got to ask you a question. What led you to decide that the Muslim Brotherhood was something you had to research and create uh, a counterterrorism course for the FBI? Well, that's uh, kind of the heart of the matter. Um, when I was uh, an agent in the, uh, after 9-11, I uh, worked counterterrorism issues, and uh, one of the cases we worked uh, dealt with uh, and touched upon the uh, Muslim chaplain program. Okay. Um, the speci specifics of how that started and what happened uh, aren't important, but what is, is as, as I looked at the chaplain program and who created it, which was Abdurrahman Alamudi, right. a Hamas Muslim brother and Al-Qaeda financier, uh, who supported it and who certified the Muslim chaplains, uh, Jesus and the Islamic Society of North America, and ISNA being the primary lead, today still certifies Muslim chaplains. ISNA is a Hamas support entity as shown in the Holy Land Foundation and through a, a wide array of evidence. So as I worked that case and built out, not just from ISNA and those related groups, but as the kind of building the circle of the Muslim organizations in America, it became clear that the vast majority of Islamic organizations in North America are controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood. And a lot of this information came out in, at the Holy Land Foundation trial in 2007 and 2008 when the Muslim Brotherhood project was admitted as evidence. Explosive information about its infiltration of America. Can you touch on that a little bit and tell us what was in that? Sure. Uh, the Holy Land Foundation trial brought to light and uh, many documents that were previously classified, but documents that we had worked with. Um, Specifically, uh, there were documents found in a search that the FBI Washington Field Office did in 2004 here in uh, Annandale, Virginia, uh, right near where we're filming today. And in the uh, basement, the agents found a sub-basement, and in the sub-basement were the archives of the Muslim Brotherhood of the United States. Now, that residence was the home of a man named Ishmael El Barassi, who was a senior Muslim Brotherhood and senior Hamas leader in the <laughs> John, before the break, you were talking about the Muslim Brotherhood, the infiltration of America. Please elaborate. Well, we were talking about the Holy Land Foundation trial and some of the documents that were recovered in the uh, search of the El Barassi residence. <clears throat> what came out of the Holy Land Foundation, a treasure trove of documents? Uh, there are just a few that I'd like to talk about in the time we have. The first I have with me is an explanatory memorandum. Now, this document was found in the residence. It is the strategic uh, Memorandum for the Muslim Brotherhood in North America. And there are several key points that I just want to point out for your audience. The first is that this was written by a senior leader of Hamas, Muhammad Akram, senior Muslim brother. We know from other documents that that's true. We know that this was approved by the Shura Council and the Organizational Conference of the Muslim Brotherhood. So it's not, ju it's not just some fly-by-night document out there. This, right. this has real oomph behind it. Yes, it has the authority of the Muslim Brotherhood leadership in North America and the International Muslim Brotherhood. And so we know that. We also know uh, from this document 
what their strategic plan is. And I'd like to just get right to that and then come back to some of the other uh, points if we have time. And this is the, the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in North America. And I want to read it verbatim. The process of settlement is a civilization jihadist process with all the word means. The Ikhwan, which is the Muslim Brotherhood, must understand their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and God's religion is made victorious over all other religions. Without this level of understanding, we are not up to this challenge and have not prepared ourselves for jihad yet. The, the biggest point to be made here is the entire strategy of the Muslim Brotherhood is to get us, our leadership, in the religious community, in the law enforcement intelligence community, in the political community, in the educational community, to get our leadership to do the Muslim Brotherhood's work for them. And I, I've actually encountered this. I was on a talk show in a uh, radio talk show in Jacksonville several months ago. And I was talking about some of these particular issues uh, about the Holy Land Foundation trial. And I kid you not, here's what the host said to me. He said, I don't believe you. Not, I disagree. Or I don't believe you. I was so taken aback, I didn't know what to do with it. Isn't that just doing exactly what you said? It, it's part of it because the, w once you look at the vast amount of evidence that came out of the Holy Land Foundation trial, which is now all accessible to the American public. It proves or it demonstrates, the evidence demonstrates that there is in fact an Islamic movement in North America and globally. It demonstrates that nearly every single Muslim organization in North America is controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood or a derivative group and that they seek to impose Islamic law in furtherance of establishing an Islamic state here. What is shocking, John, this has been admitted into evidence. What is it going to take for our leaders in Washington, D.C. to do something about this, to acknowledge this threat? What, in your opinion, should they do? Well, that's a, that's a, I think that's to the heart of the matter. Here are a couple things. Number one is this is factual. So there's no getting around it. It wasn't just a federal trial. It was the largest terrorism financing and Hamas trial in U.S. history. Wow. HLF 108, 108 guilty verdicts. Yes. Uh, and the significant jail time for the leadership right. of HLF and HLF right. was determined to be a Hamas front. Now, what's, when you ask the question, what do we expect of our leaders? I mean, I would start with they need to do their job. And the, yeah. their job starts with whether it's in the law enforcement, intelligence agencies mm -hmm. or whatever. They're required to report to Congress on what they're doing. And so what we hope to see is Congress hold them accountable and ask, why, why haven't we been told this? You know, as the FBI, as the DHS and other agencies, why aren't you informing us of this, which now is out in public? This is not classified information. It is a fact that the Islamic Society in North America, the North American Islamic Tra uh, Trust, the Muslim American Society, Muslim Student Association are all Muslim Brotherhood controlled organizations that Isna and Nate are Hamas support entities right, right. because that was demonstrated at the trial because they funneled millions of dollars. Exactly. That CARE exactly. is a Hamas entity. Right. Thank you, John. Thank you for your valuable information. We really appreciate you being with us today. We are delighted to have you. Uh, this is part of those documents that he was talking about. And... Uh, Notice again the phrase, civilization jihad process. That's what's going on in the United States. He also said that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and God's religion is made victorious over all religions. It is a Muslim's destiny to perform jihad. You say, well, what about is this? Aren't these people just the uh, the whacked out uh, group of Islam and what have you? Uh, there are radical Muslims and there are less radical Muslims. The problem is that the radical Muslims have the upper hand over the less radical Muslims. In fact, in the Quran, Allah said this: "We're watching you. We're watching to see who's going to side with Muhammad, who will fight with Muhammad, and who won't." So there is a fear factor for those that don't want to be radical to side with the radicals anyway because they're afraid of them. Here's the breakdown. This is just from California. He was talking about the circle. 
And you'll notice in the middle you have the Muslim Brotherhood, which started in 1928 and 1929 in Israel, uh, having to, you know, trying to stop the Jews from getting a, a homeland over there. But you have the Muslim Brotherhood in the middle, and then there's the Holy Land Foundation, which was a money laundering scheme, as he was saying. But notice what else is connected to it. CARE. How many have heard of CARE? Council of American Islamic Relations. They're always battling anybody that would, that would criticize anything in Islam. That's, that's CARE. You have the Muslim Student Association. been in the University of Toledo for, what, 20, 30 years now. They're part of that thing. Uh, you have, uh, well, you name it, they're there. Uh, ISNA, he was talking about the Islamic Society of North America. They're there. Uh, the Palestinian, Islam, uh, is, uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Hamas. The Mosque Foundation. I mean, they're all, they're all there. They're all connected together. And as he was saying, that's, that's common knowledge now. I, I got that other thing off the internet. You can get all that Holy Land Foundation trial stuff off the internet. Anybody can do that. And you're wondering what, what's going on with our leaders. Of course, we've wondered that for years. Here is uh, the CARE co-founder, longtime board chairman Omar Ahmad. He said this, Islam isn't in America to be equal to any other faith, but to become dominant. The Quran should be the highest authority in America, and Islam the only accepted religion on earth. There's a picture of the people from CARE. Nice looking people. They're just like you, America, except for our claims of God-given supremacy, religious ideology of violent, offensive jihad, subjugation of women to men, Jew hatred, desire to institute medieval totalitarian theocratic law in the United States, designs on global domination. Besides these minor differences, we're just like you. Here's one of the unindicted co-conspirators of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Care will define a jihad this way. Jihad does not mean holy war. Literally, jihad means to strive, struggle, and exert effort. In German, it's pronounced Mein Kampf. It's a central and broad Islamic concept that includes struggle against all evil inclinations within oneself. Okay. Struggle to improve the quality of life in society. In an Islamic mind, the only way you can pr pr uh, improve life in any society is implement Sharia law. Struggle in the battlefield of self-defense. Every Muslim is in a defensive posture since we're trying to liberate, they're trying to liberate the world for Allah. So it's a bunch of wording like that, that if you didn't know what, what they taught, you'd say, oh, that sounds pretty good. Rules of jihad. Conquered women and children may be enslaved. Women captives sometimes forced to marry their Muslim masters, etc., etc. Captured enemy may be killed, ransomed by money, or by exchange, enslaved or released freely. In other words, they can do whatever they want to do with them. The conquered are allowed or forced to convert. Convert. You're allowed to convert. <laughs> yeah. Property may be stolen. So how do you know all this? This is what they do. This is a summation of what Muslims do when they conquer a nation. Property may be stolen. Fruit trees may be destroyed. So what's the big deal about that? If you lived in the desert, that's your only, really the only source of food. Homes may be destroyed. Here's the three options imposed by Surah 929. When a Muslim army gathers outside their city gate, as Muslim interpreters agree, number one, fight and die. Number two, convert. Number three, keep their religion but pay a tax called the jizya, which Muslim apologists or defenders argue amount to protection for the privilege of living under Islam. That's extortion. Takiyah, I mentioned that uh, before, the, the right to lie. The Imam Abu Hamid Ghazali, a well-respected Muslim scholar, spe uh, quote, speaking is a means to achieve objectives. If a praiseworthy aim is attainable through both telling of the truth and lying, it is unlawful to accomplish through lying because there's no need for it. When it is possible to achieve such an aim by lying but not by telling the truth, it is permissible to lie if attaining the goal is permissible. Takiyah. They practice it all the time on the news. And the dumb Americans sit there going, oh. Uh, I'll, uh, prohibited except those believers who in some areas or are times fear for their safety from the disbelievers. In this case, such believers are allowed to show. Now watch this. In such case, no, I'm talking about a minority. In this case, such believers are allowed to show friendship to the disbelievers outwardly, but never inwardly. For instance, Al-Bukhari, who wrote one of the Hadiths, probably the main Hadith, Recorded that Abu Adarda said, we smile in the face of some people, although our hearts curse them. And as I said earlier, you can't trust a Muslim, not even if you think they're your friend. Abu Qari said that Al-Hassan said the taqiyah 
is allowed until the day of resurrection. So they can do that until it all ends. Kitman, again, is this a half-truth, close to Takiyah, but rather an outright dissimulation that consists in telling only part of the truth with mental reservation, justifying the omission of the rest. And, of course, they will, they will accuse us of being Islamophobe and so on and so forth. And, you know, that's, that's the trick nowadays. If you don't like somebody, you, you accuse them of being a phobe. You know, we, uh, you, know, you go out and preach about, uh, or against homosexuals, you're, you know, you're a uh, homophobe. And what we did was we simply turned that right back on them. Somebody gets upset with us while we're preaching, say, you're a bibliophobe. Yeah, you're a phobe too, you know. I mean, that's the thing. So they'll accuse us of being Islamophobe. Well, do we have any reason for having anti-Islamic sentiments in the United States? Well, let's see. Bombs sent via UPS synagogue in Chicago. A Baghdad church attack murdering 58 people. Fort Hood sh- Jihad shooting. Arkansas Recruit Center uh, Jihad shooting. Christmas underwear bomb attempt. Times Square Jihad bomb attempt. Ford Dix Jihad plot. North Carolina Jihad plot. Seattle Jihad shooting. JFK Jihad plot, etc., etc., etc. Pick the newspaper up today. You'll find another one. And that's why we might be a little Islamophobic. In fact, my opinion is if you're Islamophobic, it's very healthy. If I'm on an airplane and I hear some guy saying, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be concerned about that. Here's this Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harb. Dar al-Islam, the house of Islam. A country in which the edicts of Islam are fully promulgated. Notice at the bottom it says they can worship God according to their own customs, provided they are not idolaters. Do you know what we are in their sight? We're idolaters. Why? Because we believe in three gods. You say we do not. They think we do. And you know who the three gods are that they think we believe in? The Father, the Son, and Mary. You wonder where he got that idea from. It must be done without any uh, ostentation. Well, most churches and synagogues may be repaired. No new place of worship can be erected. Construction of churches and synagogues in Muslim territory is unlawful, thus being forbidden in the traditions. They can fix them, but they can't rebuild them. Dar al Harb, the house of war. A country belonging to the infidels which has not been subdued by Islam. That's what we are, the house of war. Now, here's the theological basis for it. The earth belongs to Allah and to his messenger. This leads to the idea that jihad is a defensive war liberating what already belongs to Allah and to his ummah, the Muslim community. So for them, it's a defensive thing to attack a country because they're liberating that country for Allah. Sharia law. Covers the acts, the five pillars, covers human interaction, but understand this, it's a legal code ordained by Allah for all mankind. So we're supposed to all be under Sharia law. Now, Sharia law versus liberty. Here's how they infiltrate. Stage one, again, just infiltration coming to this country. Our country is a wonderful country for uh, foreign business people. A foreigner can come to this country, buy a carryout, and pay no taxes for three years, I believe, three or five years. So then what they do is, after that period is over, they invite one of their relatives over, give the business to them, and they go another three or five years without tax, and right on down the line. So you see all these Muslims running all these carryouts. Say, what is the big deal about the carryouts? That's simply the way they can bring their relatives in. Stage two, consolidation of power. We just saw that list up there, the consolidation of power with the Muslim Brotherhood, CARE, Muslim Student Association. Stage three, open war with leadership and culture. Stage four, totalitarian, totalitarian Islamic theocracy. So we in the West will say, with, with such, you know, piety, I may disagree with what you say, but I'll defend, your death, uh, defend to the death your right to. And the Muslim says, death? I know what that is. So we're, we, we try to be pious and say, well, we'll support your rights. And all along, they're trying to take away everything we've got. How does a Muslim take over a country? As long as the Muslim population remains under around 2%, they'll be the peace-loving minority. When I first got involved with Muslims back in the late 70s, early 80s, I met a guy in Dearborn, Michigan named Victor Khalil. Some of you know Victor. I uh, met him from the old church, if you will. And uh, his dad was converted out of Islam. Uh, Victor was raised in Egypt. They lived in Lebanon for a while. He's over in London and then came to the United States and worked in Dearborn preaching to the Muslims up there. And we brought him down to the University of Toledo. We had a Muslim seminar at the University of Toledo in 1981. 
and he came and did some uh, Muslim evangelism programs, things like that. He told me this. He said, Brother Jim, he said, when you see Muslim women wearing the burqa, understand that they then believe they can control America. I didn't see women wearing the burqa until when? And the hajib until when? 1990? And all of a sudden, all this stuff pops up and you're seeing it all the time? That means they think they can actually gain control of the United States. They're gaining power. They feel it. So then they begin to wear the traditional garb. So in the United States, Muslim population, about 0.6%. Australia, 1.5%. Australia's had some problems already. Canada, Toronto is one of the largest Muslim populations in the world. China, Italy, Norway. But so far, they are the minority, the Peace-loving, how could you think we are jihadist Muslims? At 2 to 5%, they begin to proselyte from other ethnic minorities and disaffected groups, often with major recruiting from the jails. So there's a lot of Islamic recruit, recruiting in the prisons and the street gangs. Oh, won't that be exciting when the street gangs become Islamic? I would, I would, I would venture to say this, if the Lord doesn't come Saturday... That in five to ten years, I can see street gangs not doing the drive-by shootings, but maybe the beheading. I mean, in the Mexican border, they're beheading. That's where we're heading. Denmark, 2%. Germany, 3.7%. United Kingdom. Oh, London has many problems with Muslims. At 2.7%. England. There are places in England you cannot go. They've basically given them to the Muslims and let them run it by Sharia law. No-go zones, they call them. There and in Europe. From 5% on, they exercise inordinate influence in proportion to the percentage of the population. For example, they will push for the introduction of halal, that's the Islamic food, a version of kosher food, thereby securing food preparation jobs for Muslims. They'll increase pressure on supermarket chains to feature halal on their shelves, along with threats for failure to comply. And that's going on in France. And France is, France, as much as we've, as much as we've talked about the French, the French are at least taking a stand on the burqa and the hajib. You know, you're not going to come into the courtroom with that. You're not going to get your driver's license with that. At least they're taking a stand. Philippines, 5%, of, unless you're in Mindanao. Mindanao is the island, the southern island of the Philippines where they, where they are the most. And there are places there you don't want to go. I talked to Gerald Sutek a couple of weeks ago. He's going to go to the Philippines. And I said, uh, I said, I said, where are you going to go? He said, Mindanao. I said, Mindanao. I said, that, that's the Muslim place. He said, well, we know where to go and where we can't go. You, know, you, you can go certain places and certain places you don't go. Sweden, Switzerland, Netherlands. The Muslims approach 10% of the population. They increase lawlessness as a means of complaint about their condition. In Paris, we already saw car burnings, Russia, grade schools attacked. Any non-Muslim action offends Islam and results in uprisings and threats, such as in Amsterdam, with the opposition to the Mohammed cartoons. How many have seen the Motuns? And how does this peace-loving and tolerant religion respond to that? Rioting, death threats. And uh, Guyana, 10%. India, 13.4%. Israel, 16 Kenya, 10 Russia, 15 after reaching 20%, nations can expect hair-trigger rioting, jihad militia formation, sporadic killings, and the burnings of Christian churches and Jewish synagogues. I got an article of uh, March 24th of this year from Fox News. It says this, thousands of Christians have been forced to flee their homes in western Ethiopia after Muslim extremists. They throw the word extremist in there. You know what an extremist is? A good Muslim set fire to roughly 50 churches and dozens of Christian homes. At least one Christian has been killed, many more have been injured, and anywhere from 3,000 to 10,000 have been displaced in the attacks that began March 2nd after a Christian, a Christian, in the community of Asandabo was accused of desecrating the Koran. So one guy desecrates the Koran, hair trigger rioting, three to 10,000 people now out of a home. That's what happens when they reach... 32.8%. At 40%, nations experience widespread massacres, chronic terror attacks, ongoing militia warfare, 
such as Bosnia, Chad, Lebanon. Sixty percent and beyond nations experience unfettered persecution of non-believers of all other religions, including non-conforming Muslims. That's the, uh, the, the Muslims that don't want to be involved in jihad. They suffer. Sporadic ethnic cleansing, genocide, use of Sharia law as a weapon, jizya, the tax place on infidels, as in Albania, Malaysia, Qatar, and Sudan. So here we are. Washington, D.C., upper left corner, Islam will dominate. In London, as these people march, you have signs that say, behead those who insult Islam. You have massacre those who insult Islam. BBC equals British blasphemic crusaders. <laughs> little little uh, ingenuity down that one. But that's what's going on in London. This picture at the bottom left corner, God bless Hitler, that was in a city in southern Florida. Now, can you imagine if a Christian did anything like that? If we said behead those who desecrate the Bible, we'd be in jail. They'd throw us in, throw the key away. Here's a little child down here carrying a sign. Whosoever insults a prophet, kill him. It's a religion of hate. Surah 860 says, Against them the unbelievers make ready your strength to the utmost of your power, include seeds of war, to strike terror into the hearts of the enemies. This is Muhammad Fahid, head of the Muslim Student Association, at a meeting at this Queensboro Community College in New York City. He said this, we reject the UN, reject America, reject all law and order, don't lobby Congress or protest because we don't recognize Congress. The only relationship you should have with America is to topple it. Eventually there will be a Muslim in the White House. Huh. Dictating the laws of Sharia. They got halfway on that one. But that was stayed in New York City. Siraj Wahaj, American Muslim leader, 2002, said, If only Muslims were clever politi politically, they could take over the United States, replace it, its constitutional government with a caliphate. And yet Jesus Christ said this, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So I don't know how you, you think about this. Some people are scared when they see this kind of stuff. We shouldn't be scared. We should be concerned. But the fact of the matter is, as I mentioned earlier, these people can be converted. And Jesus Christ loves Muslims as much as he loves Americans. And the blood that Jesus Christ shed on Calvary's cross was the blood that cleansed you of your sin and cleansed the sin of Osama bin Laden if he would have taken it, or Saddam Hussein if he would have taken it, or any other Muslim. And these people need to come, at least we need to do, is try to evangelize them. I said earlier... When they do get converted, they become incredible. Uh, I mentioned Victor Khalil. I was at his church one time meeting up in Dearborn, Michigan. The guy that opened in prayer. And this is an Arabic church. Opened in prayer for a half hour in Arabic. And I'm getting into it. I don't understand what he's saying, but I'm getting into it. And then they have their preaching service and all that. And then they fellowship after that. And here's one guy. Two guys come up to me. He says, you know where I'm from? I said, no. He said, I'm from Iraq. And the other guy says, you know where I'm from? I'm from Iran. Now, this is when they're fighting each other. He says, we're brothers in Christ. There was a Palestinian there and an Egyptian there and, a, and a, um, yeah, an Arab Israeli there. Muslim uh, that lived in it. And they all loved each other. And it's just it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to see these people go along. He had a guy in his church named Freddie. Freddie was the one of the stuntmen for Eric Estrada. Remember that program, Chips? He was one of the stuntmen for Eric, Eric Strato. When we had that seminar at the University of Toledo, when it was all over, he had some Muslim from India. A guy had a turban on. He had, some, he had him pinned in the corner for probably an hour. And just witness, 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 witness answered every question he had, raised questions this guy couldn't answer. And we, we basically finally had to pull him away, so man, it's time to go. I don't know whatever happened to that guy, but Freddie was on fire. These guys get converted, they get on fire. So the next time you see a Muslim at Walmart or Target or Sears or Pennies, approach them with a gospel tract. Get, get some of these gospel tracts in the Koran Testament or some of these ones here that I've put together. Do this, though, 
If you're a man, try to have your wife approach the Muslim lady. It's very rude in their culture. Of course, beheading is too, I guess. But it's very rude in their culture for a man to approach a woman. So try to get your daughters, try to get your wife to take a gospel track to the lady. Now, if the husband is there, then you can approach the man. But we need to be trying to do something with these people. Uh, I got my, my first uh, involvement in Muslim evangelism was... Uh, at the old church that I, that I started at, that uh, we did a religious survey. And we used to go door to door doing this religious survey. Of course, when it started snowing and what have you, nobody wanted to go out and do a religious survey. So I realized, you know, you can pick up a phone book and do religious surveys over the phone. Okay, we started in A's. It doesn't take long before you get to al Alaba and Al-Arabi and Al-Ababa and Alibaba and all those other crowd. And... I began getting an interest in Islam because I never, never knew it. I knew it existed, but I never knew how to deal with it. And we were able to send gospel tracts and books and found out a place that produces uh, Arabic literature. Uh, there's a big place up in Toronto, Fellowship of Faith for Muslims. They have all kinds of literature in, in a lot of different languages. Uh, but we need to do something for these, uh, with these people. We need to try to get the gospel to them. And uh, it would be a wonderful thing to have somebody get saved out of the mosque in Perrysburg and join our church and start a ministry to them. Amen. Now, I've got just a couple minutes left. I know I shouldn't do this, but are there any questions? Are there any questions? Yes. All right. Listen, listen to this closely. Answering-Islam.org answering slash islam dot org. It is the website that has everything. It is a searchable website. You put in a subject, it'll show you every piece of literature they have that covers that subject. So answering dash islam dot org, I believe is what it is. It's org or com. Will that help you? You had two questions? Mm-hmm. Apparently they're boycotting Pepsi for something. I don't know. Somebody probably desecrated a Koran or something at the Pepsi company. Yes, sir. It's it's. It's enough to make your life miserable. I mean, that's because, again, the whole idea is not the money. It's the submission. It's the humiliation. In some Islamic countries, they like the, uh, the dhimmis to do it publicly, pay the tax publicly, and they like to mock them and make fun of them as they do that. And it's just a whole humiliation thing. So, yes. Okay. 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 You know, like I said, I was born and raised in Dearborn. Uh, my kids attended Dearborn schools, and they are very strong in supporting Ramadan, mm-hmm. halal, mm-hmm. and it's, it's huge. And I mean, you know, you, you go against that at all. And if, I, if my kids were to go against that in school, they'd be suspended. Right. You know, bring the Bible into school and see what happens. Yeah. So it's very real, is all I It is very real. And there's a, uh, there's a ministry called Acts 17. David Wood and uh, a couple others are involved in that. Now, they're not in our camp, okay? But they are missionaries to Muslims. They went into Dearborn during one of the festivals and were arrested. And I think they eventually won that case in court. There's videos online, Acts 17 dot something, org or com or what have you. But... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been there. I, you drive underneath the bridge, underneath the railroad tracks, and when you come up, everything's in Arabic. Um, the minarets can call to prayer five times a day. That's one of the things Victor wanted to, wanted to oppose. He said, look, how come you get to do that and I can't, you know, broadcast something over the air like that? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. 
Allah is the, is the moon god. Allah is the moon god. And before Islam showed up, the moon god had three daughters, Allah, Allah, and uh, Manat. I think that's their names. What Muhammad did, that was, that was Muhammad's tribe, the Quraysh. That was the god of the Quraysh tribe. Muhammad simply cleaned it up a little bit and got rid of the daughters. Well, they try to deny, they don't try to deny anything, but that's the truth. I mean, if you you go into history, you deal with Muslims. Here's what's going to happen: you're going to present the facts, and they're going to look at you and say you're a liar, you're stupid. That, that's that's you know, if you can get them to debate, that's a wonderful thing, because this Acts 17 ministry debates these guys, debates their apologists, and they really don't have a leg to stand on. But really, it doesn't matter because you know, if Allah says it, that's the truth. And don't confuse me with the facts. Yes, sir. All right, you saw what happened to Peter King when he did it, right? When Peter King challenged these guys, you saw the attack on Peter King. You know, and he was right. He's taking the facts, he's presenting it, he's questioning people, and they call him a, who was the communist guy? McCarthy. They labeled it as McCarthyism. I, beats me. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. Of course, if, you, if you're looking for sense in Washington, good luck. You're not going to find it. Uh, yes, anyone else? Yes. They're practicing friendship evangelism. How close do you want to get to a Muslim as far as a friendship?